nice ones too. Yeah. All right. We're moving on to male genitalia system. Looks like everyone's got a little caffeine except Wes. No? Passing? All right. So let's talk about the male genitalia system. I'm sorry, guys. We got to talk about penises and testicles and stuff like that. So we already got laughing. Shelly, we just started. So let's just talk about it, okay? Now, uh, the, let's just read what. Yeah. So this is obviously related to the urinary system. And really, as paramedics, we don't hit a lot of... Um, you know, there's not a lot of genitalia emergencies. We'll talk about the few there are, like priapism. But, uh, you know, they, there's not a whole lot of this. But let's just talk about it, okay? So this is the bladder, okay? So the ureter dumps into the bladder, and the urethra actually starts here, okay? There's three different segments of the male urethra. You don't even know what they are, but just know that there's different segments. And the urethra is very, very long in comparison to a, a female's urethra. So why is that important? It's because it's a lot harder to uh, get a UTI in a male. It's not impossible, it certainly happens, but uh, it's, it's a lot more difficult to happen. So urine will go through the urethra, which passes through the prostate and out through the penis, through you know, what they call the prepuce, and then the glands penis, and then, and then it goes out. Um, uh, <coughs> now, well, we'll jump into um, the reproductive and re uh, anatomy, I'm sorry. Uh, did I hit record on that? Yeah. Sweet. Um, so the testy sits obviously in the scrotum, and, on, and, and you may not know this, but there's this thing called the epididymis that is sitting on top of the testy like, like this. Uh, and that's what they're showing you here. And this is where a lot, this is where sperm is made, and it's kind of, it works in conjunction with the testy, okay? Um, so, it is important because we're going to talk about pathology called the epididymitis, right? Which is inflammation of this versus orchitis, inflammation of the testy. So we're going to have to talk about that. So the epididymis sits on top of the testy like this. Uh, so what happens is uh, sperm is produced here and it goes out through the, if someone, you know, in, in the case of ejaculation, right? It goes out through the vast difference. So have you heard of a vasectomy, right? What happens is they make an incision here in the back of the scrotum. They get a little crochet hook. And they ablate, they cut that, they burn it off, right? And so this way, if you're shutting down the highway of sperm travel, it cannot get out. So this is uh, one way that you can perform birth control. So you can't get it out, okay? So in a normal case, it goes through the epididymis, testes, through the vast difference. The vast difference is very long. And this is just straight up sperm, okay? It is not mixed with seminal fluid yet. Where this mixture takes place is in the <coughs> seminal vesicles. And so during ejaculation, the seminal, the seminal vesicles dump with sperm at the same time, and they kind of mix with this mucinous, very high in zinc, very high in simple sugar, sucrose. And why do you think that sperm needs a high amount of sucrose? Why? Those little swimmers, right? The flagella, the tail, that takes a tremendous amount of energy. So there is a huge amount of mitochondria sitting in the, the back part of a sperm to help them swim. And you're going to see how far they actually have to swim during fertilization. It's a long way. So what happens is they mix here. You also have your bulbulorethal gland, also known as the calcary gland. And then this is where you know, it would go out through the urethra, and that is ejaculation. Now, something they somewhat want you to know, and you may want to take a picture of this, I see, I've seen it tested, is what is the pathway of sperm during ejaculation? And there is the mnemonic of 7-up, right? Seminiferous tubules to the epididymis, to the vas deferens, to the ejaculatory ducts, nothing, urethra penis, right? And it makes sense, right? Because I just, and, and it's fairly intuitive. So they may ask you to put this in order, and they want you to know that. And why would they do that? They really don't care that a paramedic knows about ejaculation. They care that you know the pathway of it, so that you understand anatomy of it, okay? Um, now, moving over, this is what I was talking about. This is the epididymis sitting on top of the testes, okay? Uh, and this would be the vast difference coming out, out, out the back end, okay? Where actual... Uh, 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 Sperm is produced in the seminiferous tubules, okay? What else is also produced in the testes? Testosterone. Testosterone, right? It's produced, so testes is producing this green stuff, and in the, I mean, it's not really green in the real world, but in this pink stuff, it's these supportive cells called Leydig cells, 
and these produce testosterone, okay? Um, so just be generally aware of uh, the testicle. And back, uh, this is the penis, okay? So if you were to take a cross section of the penis, this is it, okay? So this is your, the urethra. And what causes, uh, is down here, this is the urethra. What causes erection is increased blood flow. So what does Viagra, Cialis, you know, Sildenafil, what do these drugs do? They cause an increase in blood flow. Blood flow. They cause vasodilation, um, and, and, and that's how these work. So just be, you, you know, they're not going to, they do this in medical school a lot. They'll just, cr they'll give you a cross-section, and you have to know what you're looking at, um, and it's like a real cross-section. So just be aware, uh, some general anatomy of that, okay? Um, and you can see the same thing in their, in, in, in their information of uh, the anatomy. Now, has anybody ever heard of a digital rectal exam? Right? Yeah? So the reason for that, to give you an idea of where the prostate is located, is if you go, a physician, right? Not paramedics, not nurses, a physician, where to go through the rectum, right? Right when you go through, the prostate sits back here to where you can fill it. You should be able to fill it. But it's small. I always thought the prostate was like the like I always thought it was big because like the pictures were showing you it looks pretty big. It's really pretty small. They say it's about the size of a walnut. So it's not like this big structure. That's I thought I always thought it was big. It's not. It's not supposed to be. Okay. Um, so it's pretty small and it sits back here. And oddly enough, cancer likes to build up on the back side of the prostate. Like that's where it prefers to go. So what happens is is a physician, not a paramedic, but a physician, were to fill back here and it feels rough and bumpy right, like corn instead of being smooth, like a corn cob, um, then, then you might think, oh wow, this is probably cancer, right? And they might be able to feel back here and say, well, it's round and smooth, it's just really big, right? That's benign prostate hypertrophy versus it being likely cancer, okay? Prostate cancer is one of the more uh, common and lethal cancers in, in men right now, okay? It's hard to diagnose, so it's very hard to diagnose. So it, it goes for a long time until we notice it, okay? Um, any questions on that one? No? Well, here is the prostate. This is what we were talking about. But uh, again, you can see this here. If a physician were to stick a glove finger through here, you could feel the back part of the prostate. That's what that is, okay? Um, and that's a cross-section of the penis. And this is, this is a cross-section of the prostate. Something I want you to respect and realize is the urethra runs right through the middle of the prostate. So if this prostate gets really, really big, benign prostatic hypertrophy or cancer, what's gonna to happen to the urethra? It's gonna be pushed on. So when the urethra gets squeezed on, it's really hard to get urine through a water hose that is being squeezed on. So what do men present with? Difficulty urinating, frequent urination, because they can't void completely, uh, dribbling when they urinate, because they, the, the hole, right, the urethra, is being pushed on by this swelling prostate. So uh, that's how that happens. Now, uh, have y'all heard of the medication finasteride, right? So a lot of men take this medication finasteride. It blocks the more potent form of testosterone known as dihydrotestosterone. And basically, uh, a lot of older men end up having to take this because of benign prostatic hypertrophy. It's also used in male pattern baldness, right? So high amounts of this very potent form of testosterone, DHT, will cause male pattern baldness. Uh, so these, these go together. Now, lastly, there is this medication called tam tamulosin, right? It's an alpha-1 antagonist. So an alpha-1 agonist example would be phenylephrine, epinephrine. So tamulosin will tell the smooth muscle to relax. Well, what happens, which is consequential, is we have a lot of alpha-1 receptors in the smooth muscle of the prostate. So if you have someone that can't pee because the smooth muscle in here is too much, is too active, you can take tamulosin and it will cause this to dilate and it won't be squeezed down as tight to where they can urinate more commonly. So that's just something to be aware of. Uh, alpha-1 antagonist, that's one of the few uh, examples of that, okay? Any questions on that? No? All right. Um, this is what I was talking about. They want you to know during the ejaculation, it's seven up, right? Seminiferous tubules, epididymis, vas deferens, ejaculatory ducts, nothing. Urethra and then out through the penis, okay? Um, real quickly, have y'all ever heard of the pathology in uh, uh, neurogenic shock, someone having an erection, have like priapism, have y'all heard of that, okay? Uh, there's, there's reason for that. So you could know that um, uh, erection, right, is the parasympathetic nervous system. 
And how people will remember that, uh, sympathetic, is point for parasympathetic, right? Like an erection, okay? And the an ejaculation, right, is the sympathetic nervous system. And how people remember that is through shoot, okay? So shoot, sympathetic, sympathetic, right? Now, the reason I'm telling you this is you may have wondered, well, what is neurogenic shock, right? It's a form of distributive shock. You have loss of sympathetic tone. So we know the parasympathetic and uh, sympathetic nervous system are in constant battle with each other. So what happens is when you lose the sympathetic nervous system, the parasympathetic system will overdrive. So when you lose sympathetic over, uh, drive, you have vasodilation. That is why you have uh, distributive shock in neurogenic shock or distributed, the form of distributive shock in neurogenic shock. That is also why you could have priapism, right? The medical word for erection when uh, you have loss of sympathetic tone. Uh, but I do want you to know, I read an article on this preparing for a PHTLS class I was teaching several months ago. Um, be aware, uh, first, we don't routinely inspect genitalia as paramedics. Okay, so be aware, if they're telling you to inspect genitalia, it might be the wrong answer, think twice. Okay, it's, it might be wrong. But I want you to be aware. Uh, when I thought that if someone in neurogenic shock, like after a hanging or something, that you might see uh, like a full-blown, quote, pinching a tent, right? A full erection. But what you're more likely to see is uh, kind of like a semi-erection, just where there's increased blood flow to the penis. And I think that's almost in like 70% of cases. It wasn't a full erection, it was just a partial erection. So I'm just kind of pointing that out um, for, to tie into this to, to trauma and neurogenic shock, okay? Any questions on that? No? Okay. Patient assessment area is a little bit repetitive. It's annoying. Uh, I feel like they say the same stuff every single PowerPoint, so I don't have a lot to say on these. Um, like, ask the right questions. Okay, that's helpful in a lecture. Um, history of physical exam, yeah. Um, okay, we could talk about this. So we need to talk about visceral and referred pain. So um, if someone has, uh, what is referred pain? Let's just stop there. Or what is referred pain? Else. You're feeling it somewhere else. Can, does anyone, can anyone give me an example of referred pain? Like they hurt your uh, spleen or feel it in their shoulder. Very good, Shelly. So let's talk about that. So the spleen, if this is the left side and this is the right side, here's the diaphragm and here is the spleen. Okay, on this side is the liver, right? And inside the liver is the gallbladder, okay? So what happens is if the spleen ruptures, the phrenic nerve, right, runs up through the diaphragm and up through the shoulder, okay? And if here's the patient's head and here's their neck, it runs up through their neck and up through their shoulder. So the reason that you feel referred pain in your shoulder from a spleen injury instead of feeling it down in your ribs is because the diaphragm is getting annoyed and it's running that sensation up through your neck. Well, the same exact thing happens with gallbladder pathology. That's why you have referred right shoulder pain um, with gallbladder pathology. It's because, again, it's irritating the, gall the diaphragm, the phrenic nerve, and it runs up through the neck, okay? So there is also a pathology that this happens with uh, kidney stones. So a lot of times, males will feel a kidney stone, they will have scrotal pain. So you could just hear 28 year old male had flank pain and now they have scrotal pain. And you're thinking, hmm, that's weird. That doesn't sound very paramedic like, but they might be pushing you to think this is a kidney stone, okay? So be aware as that kidney stone travels, it can cause different areas of pain, okay? That's why uh, I'm, I'm talking about that, okay? Now, uh, visceral pain versus uh, parietal pain. Which one is more, uh, is, is more vague? Visceral pain or parietal pain? Parietal. It's visceral. Yeah, you had a 50-50 shot, right? But it's visceral pain is, is very uh, nonspecific. So they'll just know in this general area, it just feels uncomfortable. Versus parietal pain, in the case of pleurisy, they'll say it hurts like right here. Like they, it's very easy to pinpoint it. So uh, why am I telling you this? Because they occasionally will ask you to distinguish the two of those on an exam, okay? It's basic uh, pathophysiology, okay? Um, real quick, I feel like paramedic, I, it kills me. Paramedic students are getting this messed up. What, let's go around the room on OPQRST. What does the O mean? O to provocation. What does it mean, Wes? Provocation. Uh, what makes it better or worse? Like Good job. Or mm -hmm. something like that. Q 
Quality. R. Rating. Okay. Zero. On a scale of what? Zero to ten. Good. Zero to ten. Not one to ten. <clears throat> Zero to ten. And T? T is for time for one. Perfect. We ran out. We had just enough students to get good. All right. Good. All right. So we have to know this whole quadrant system without looking. What is in the left upper quadrant? What are some organs? Spleen. Good. The spleen, definitely. Okay, specifically right here. In fact, I just gave away the answer key up there, but look. I want you to appreciate on the guy here, the spleen is pretty low down. It's not massively protected by the ribs. It is protected by the ribs, but if someone has splenomegaly or some type of pathology with the spleen, the spleen will go grow in this direction, okay? So the spleen is here. What is the job of the spleen? What? Red blood cells. Yes, it filters blood, right? Red blood cells. It also is the, it stores all the macrophages or the majority of macrophages. Those are those little Pac-Man guys, white blood cells. It also holds platelets. The vast majority of platelets are held in the spleen. Like the massive amount of them are held in the spleen. Okay. Um, so, cause I had a student last class, he said, well, he got a national registry prep question that said someone took a baseball bat to the left rib cage. Which one is more likely injured the lungs or the spleen? What do y'all think? Lungs. It's probably the spleen. Okay. And that was the correct answer. And he was like, well, I wasn't sure why it's because it's a little less protected. Okay. And really think about this intuitively. These ribs are quite a bit more sound because they're connected in two places versus these down here. These are pretty easy to break. You know what I'm saying? All right, so Wes said the stomach is in there. I want to point out the stomach is there, but you may not feel it on the left side. Where do we typically feel a dot like stomach pain? Epigastric the epigastric region, kind of in the middle, okay? Um, not really a phenomenon of referred pain. And, and here on the break, or before we take a break, I'm going to do some quick anatomy review with y'all. Okay? There's a tail of the pancreas, too, don't you? Good, very good, Shelly. You do have the tail of the pancreas. In fact, I'll just uh, I'll show this to y'all in a minute. But, uh, okay, so what's on the right side, Shelly? Liver, gallbladder. Liver, gallbladder, good. Five, so the duodenum, yeah. right? We have some guts there, okay? What about the right lower? Appendix. Appendix, good, in a male. And in a female, there's something else there. Ovaries. Ovaries, okay? I'll tell you why this becomes important. Male, 28 year male, complaining of right lower quadrant abdominal pain, probably appendicitis nine times out of 10, okay? Female, 28 years old, complaining of right lower quadrant abdominal pain, appendicitis, <coughs> or ectopic pregnancy, or an ovarian cyst, right? Becomes a lot more complicated. Now, the left lower quadrant, what do y'all think about that? What's there? Good. Well, yeah, yes. Ovary. You're killing it, Shelly. There is an ovary there. So, but let's say 10-year-old boy, left lower quadrant abdominal pain. What do you think it is? Appendicitis. Full of shit. You're <laughs> taking my word, Shelly. Have you seen my lectures? <laughs> We literally call it, when I worked at Cook's, they would call it FOS. Literally, they would be like, oh, he's FOS. Full of shit, right? And they would need an enema. Kids hold their poop at school. Can't blame them, you know? Never People been. throw wet paper towels on you. It's terrible. <laughs> but uh, yeah, FOS. So that is now in a female, childbearing age, 16-year-old female, right? Uh, left lower quadrant pain. It could be full of shit. It could be ectopic pregnancy. It could be ovarian cyst. It could be endometriosis, right? It could be a lot of pathologies with lower abdominal quadrant pain in females, okay? Y'all good with that? Now, this is the four quadrant div division, um, and it's pretty self-explanatory, but I think it get, uh, oh, and this is, this is one of the few times you'll get to see the appendix on this slide, so I want to point it out. So we have the bottom of the, so, <laughs> The, the small intestine dumps down here, and this area is called the cecum. This first area is spelled with a C, cecum. Um, but the appendix is this little finger thing hanging off the edge of the cecum. So I want you to find out where this is real quick. Everyone find your belly button. Everyone find the tip of your pelvis. Now I want you to imagine you're, to, you're cutting this puppy into thirds. One third, two thirds, three thirds is the tip of your pelvis. Make sense? Where is your appendix? It's the two thirds mark. It's right here. And if I were to lift up my shirt, I ain't doing it. I've had an appendectomy, so guess what? There's a scar there, okay? So just be aware, that is where the appendix is at. As a general rule, that's where it's at, okay? Um, now, one thing I do wanna point out is it doesn't always point down, like, like in anatomy models, where it's just pointing down to the floor. It could be up, down, I mean, it's, it's like a little, 
you know, floppy thing. So it can go every which way. So this can be kind of difficult for surgeons to find because it may not be pointing. Do we need the appendix to live? No. no. Uh, it's a structure that we're not really using anymore. They think it had to do back when humans ate grass. Okay, they thought that it had something to do with some type of di like a gizzard. Okay. All right, now the nine quadrant region. Now this throws students off because they use big <coughs> words like left hypochondriac region, right? It's just below the, okay, so the, uh, what, what is this? Uh, I can't think of the, the angle here in your back. Costochondral CDA. Yeah, the costochondral angle, right? Is the, so what they're saying is it's below that. And the chondral angle is kind of like the angle of your diaphragm, more or less. So what they're saying is below the diaphragm, but on the left side. Okay, so that's what that means. So what sits in there? Your spleen, uh, the tail of your pancreas, okay? The right hypochondriac region, right? So the gallbladder, the liver. Um, and, and just a real quick on how poop works, okay? So we eat food, goes through the esophagus, down through the stomach, through the duodenum, you have to know the order of these. Duodenum to the jejunum to the ileum, D-J-I. You gotta know that. Those are all small bowels. And then it dumps into the cecum, which is the ascending colon to the transverse colon to the descending colon to the sigmoid colon. Well, the sigmoid colon has an S in it and it's also S-shaped, okay? Down to the rectum, through the anus, and into your toilet, right? So that is the order of food into poop that goes through the human body. It is expected for paramedics to know that, okay? So make sure Wait, that you know that well. It starts with the duodenum, 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 then the jejunum, then the ileum, okay? okay? Yeah. Then the cecum, ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid. Okay, uh, so just be aware. Uh, now we know the epigastric region. The reason that I'm telling you that you feel abdominal pain in the epigastric region, can you appreciate that from this picture? The majority of the stomach is sitting kind of in the middle. It just has more of a leftward curve than like the right. So it doesn't really sit on the left side of your chest. It just kind of pushes in there just a little bit, okay? So uh, just be generally aware of that, okay? Um, yeah, so electrolyte imbalances can cause, cause rapid deterioration and, and, you know, function of the organs. That makes sense. And we're, we're talking about renal stuff still. I know I just kind of talked about GI stuff, but uh, we'll keep on moving. So pain management. Someone, please help me out. Give me a pain management dose for someone with extreme excruciating abdominal pain. Besides Robin. Give me a dose of pain management. Good. Okay, what's the dose of fentanyl west? Help me out. The range. One mil microgram. Per kilogram? Good. Typically 25 to 100 kilograms, or 100 micrograms, I'm sorry. What if they're 200 kilograms less? Do we give them 200 micrograms of fentanyl? No, we stop at 100. No more than 100 at, at a time. Typically, I don't do more than 50. Because just like when I make my cookies, which my neighbor made cookies. So I'm going to share cookies with y'all. Dude, they're cookies. Y'all are be, being good today, so you, you get some cookies here on the next break. But uh, just like when you're making your cookies, you can always put more salt and sugar in, but you can't get it out. Okay? So you can always give them more fentanyl. You cannot get it back. Now, what's another dose? We talked about fentanyl. What else? What does that leave? Morphine. Morphine. What's the morphine dose? Four. Four milligrams. What's the dose that we give with it? Four milligrams of Zofran. Yes, great. What's the generic name of Zofran? Odontocentron. Yes, very good. You're killing it. Making me happy. Okay, now there is this old um, garbage theory of we don't treat abdominal pain with, uh, with narcotics. And it's just stupid, okay? Um, we have such advanced imaging now that it's stupid to leave someone in excruciating pain. Now, you know, 10-year-old boy, mild, rates of pain, 3 out of 10, left lower quadrant abdominal pain. Yeah, he doesn't need fentanyl or morphine, right? He's constipated. By the way, narcotics slow down the gut, so they will always cause constipation. Keep that in mind. Narcotics do cause constipation. So someone taking Norco every day, 10 out of 10 times, they're constipated, okay? It slows down the gut, just how it works. Now, further... Uh, there used to be this theory that we just don't give pain management to abdominal pains. We definitely do. And it's not my opinion, but your book's telling you this too. So don't fall into that trap. Now your preceptor may not think that way. That's between you and him or her. But I'm telling you, your book, your exams, they do expect you to treat abdominal pain. Why do you think people were withholding uh, narcotics to abdominal pains? They thought that um, you would mask the symptoms. 
So yeah, probably back in the 70s before CT and MRI, you know, a physician would have to go in there and palpate and figure out where is this pathology. But now with imaging, sono, CT, MRI, right? That's really not necessary. Now, with that said, which one has a shorter half-life? Fentanyl or morphine? Fentanyl. Fentanyl. So I tend to, it's not a hard rule, just something to consider. I tended to treat uh, uh, abdominal pains with fentanyl. Has a shorter half-life, so it will wear off quicker, okay? And then the hospital can treat them. Make sense? Now, um, nausea and vomiting are possible. Do we know the other drug that we can use for nausea and vomiting? Finnergan. Finnergan, good. What's the trade name of Finnergan? Rappers love to talk about it. Promethazine, right? I think they call it Cezurup or something to that effect, okay? So that's what the kids call it. Now, let's talk about urinary tract infections. These are very common and uh, <coughs> you, uh, yeah, we'll talk about this. Uh, so it develops in the lower urinary tract, of course, okay? And this is more common in women. Why is it more common in women than that? The urethra, the urethra is shorter, good. Um, now, think about what urinary tract infection is. It's almost always a bacteria, okay? Now, women, inadvertently, when you're pooping, is there bacteria in poop? Yes. So if they are not cleaning themselves properly, right, and if they get poop up towards the urethra, it has a very short way to go before it can cause infection, okay? That's one way this happens. Think of brainstorm. What are some other ways we can get UTIs? I told you it happens in old people. Incontinence, pooping in a diaper, right? The medical word for a diaper is a brief, so don't call them diapers, but pooping in a brief. If someone is sitting in their poop, right, does that increase the risk for infection? Yes. Help me out. Yes, come on. Uh, now, what about um, an indwelling Foley catheter? Yes, it's a super highway for it to climb up that catheter and into the urethra. Um, what about someone who's having sex? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Staph, Staphylococcus, right? It's like they call it the honeymoon UTI, right? People that start having sex, like females, they will get UTIs. It's like a known thing, okay? So just be aware, uh, UTIs can happen in all ages. Now, there's a hallmark sign of UTI in old people that you have to know because it makes zero sense to me. Does anyone want to guess what it is? What's, when I used to work in a nursing home, if we saw this, it was like, oh, they, they have a UTI. Or you're going to test them for UTI. Yeah, altered mental status. Really weird, okay? So if, you know, Shelly, who's normally nice and playful, and now she's throwing water on me and kicking and spitting on me, you might think, hmm, she might have a UTI, okay? So be aware of that. Sudden changes in mentation in an older person, especially their behavior personality, right? Whether it's insomnia, hypersomnia, irritation, irritability, confusion, you know, any type of mental status change, one of the first workups they're gonna get in the ER is urine. They're gonna see if they have a UTI, okay? So be aware, that is a very, very important thing to look for. And the reason I'm saying it makes no sense, it makes no sense that infection of the urinary tract can cause altered mental status so profoundly, but it is highly sensitive and specific. You see it almost, I would say you see this almost always. Even in young people, they will, they'll feel foggy, they'll feel hazy. They're just like, I feel like I'm living in the clouds right? You might think it's a UTI, okay? Um, so this will spread if it's untreated, and these are called ascending infections. So it starts in the urethra and then to the bladder. So I need you to know, you're going to see this word, that cystitis equals bladder infection, okay? So they are probably not going to use the word bladder infection. They're going to call it cystitis. Got to know that, and it pops up on exams and it scares students. So it can start from the urethra into the bladder, and then what's the next place that if it's ascending, where's it gonna go next? The ureters. the ureters and then to the kidneys, okay? When it gets to the kidneys, it's called pyelonephritis. Okay, and that's a kidney infection. Pylo, whoops, pyelonephritis. That's what turns out septic when it gets to kidneys, correct? Yes, this is where it becomes rather bad. Uh, and it can, be, it can be very lethal. Now, so that's why these have to be treated. So I know we see a lot of UTIs and we think, oh, it's just a UTI. And for us in this room, it is just a UTI, it's antibiotics, you can send them home. But 80 year old lady who's sick and has heart failure and diabetes, right? It's not just UTI, it turns into a major problem, okay? Um, yeah, kidney stones can also cause these. Now we need to talk about how this presents. You, uh, let me ask you this. With just a straight up UTI, do you typically have fever? 
it's an infection. Do you typically have fever with a UTI? Yes. It's a trick question, you don't. And that's what's weird, and that's why examiners will go after it. They will tell you, 88-year-old female, indwelling catheter, history of fecal incontinence, she is confused, she is afebrile, there are specks of mucus in her Foley catheter bag, she is complaining of lower, you know, they're gonna paint the picture, but they might tell you she does not have fever, and that's what's really weird about UTIs and can make them difficult to diagnose. They typically don't have fever. Can they have fever? Yes. Now, Dylan, as it ascends into the ureters, into the bladder, into the kidneys, you will have fever. But just a straight up, straight up stone cold UTI, you will not have fever typically. So be aware of that, that you'll see that on exams occasionally, and they try to trick you on that. Okay? So it's like across like all ages. Like all like ages. It's, and it's very strange. You're like, what? Infection without fever? Lots of white blood cells? I know. Weird. But they don't typically have fever if it's just a straight up UTI. Now, when people start having fever, you need to be thinking bladder infection, kidney infection, right? So cystitis. A pyelonephritis. Yes, Robin. Well, that be something that we can write about later in the shock, the, the shock modules about hot and cold sepsis. Or... Um, actually, we were supposed to cover that. I think a little bit of infectious disease, but it wasn't voted on heavily. So, and it sucks. I made a PowerPoint for it and all, but well, I might do one on Teams next week if I have time. Just record it. So, um, costovertebral angle tenderness. What is it? And this is talking about a kidney infection. So, you know, your kidneys are sitting up here. So when someone gets a kidney infection, this area will actually start to hurt, okay? There, we don't do this as paramedics, but there's something called balloting a kidney. So what happens is you could put your fist on someone's costal vertebral angle and, and, and hit it. Okay, we don't do this as paramedics, but that will, they will come off the stretcher, right? Because it's going to hurt. It's gonna hurt really, really bad. Uh, and I really don't think that's common practice anymore with, with imaging. You know, you can, usually, you can usually diagnose this based off the interview, okay? Um, uh, yeah, okay. So, the classic symptoms, gotta know this word, it's called dysuria. What does that mean? Dysuria means literally painful urination, okay? And so they're not gonna say the patient reports painful urination. They might use the patient reports dysuria. This isn't me being fancy, this is in your book, okay? Frequent urges to urinate, okay? Uh, difficulty urinating and pain. They could also not have pain. They could report itching, burning, okay? Now, the National Registry is not going to ask you to figure out the difference between a UTI and an STD. They're not going to expect you to know the difference between gonorrhea and E. coli UTI, okay? Just be aware that the, there's overlap between this and an STD, okay? Uh, the vital signs will vary based on the degree of illness. We've kind of talked about that. Now, really it's supportive care. Uh, you do have to be aware that urosepsis is a very big killer. It does actually kill people. Uh, these patients do require transport. Uh, Weatherford used to ship these guys out all the time to go see a urologist, which is really silly in hindsight, but that's what they did, so we, we did it at the time. But uh, just be aware that they do need to go to the hospital. This isn't, you know, again, it's like a febrile seizure, right? It's not like it's gonna kill them this, right this instant, but they still need to be seen, okay? They still need antibiotics, they still need treatment. Uh, and, and it's not uncommon for these patients to get IV antibiotics, especially old people, like unwell people, diabetic people, okay? Um, so patients with pyelonephritis or sepsis require very aggressive treatment. Again, that's called urosepsis. It can be very deadly. Uh, and they can also have nausea or vomiting, but we've talked about that, okay? This is a urinary catheter. I'm not going to teach you all how to catheterize patients, uh, but if you work in a hospital, they will teach you how to do this, okay? It is a paramedic thing. Paramedics are allowed to do it but it's not something that we're gonna teach you how to do. I wasn't taught in paramedic school. I used to work at Cook, so we used to do this all the time uh, to kids, which is more difficult. Um, but just, it makes sense, right? You go, this is a very sterile procedure, right? Hospitals and nurses flip out if you end up introducing bacteria into this because it causes hospital-borne infections, also known as a nosocomial infection, right? Uh, and hospitals get dinged on this, and this can kill patients, right? You're, th this, is, this is harmful to patients. So it has to be sterile. So if you're on your clinicals and the nurse freaks out because you just, just touched her sterile field, right? You earned it, okay? So you've got to be careful doing this and it has to be clean. So again, urine is, is sterile. It should be sterile. What happens is you lubricate the tip of this tube and this bulb is deflated. This bulb doesn't hold air. It holds saline. So it's like a, you know, it, it's got some weight to it, but it's, it's obviously deflated. You insert it. And what happens is there's a sphincter right here before you get to the bladder. So we would insert it, the kid would start screaming, don't blame them. And the second they would take a breath in, it was enough time for that sphincter to relax and then boom, we would force it 
you know, not force, but push it while that sphincter relaxed for a second into the bladder, you would get urine return. You know, usually we would just in and out cath them. We wouldn't inflate this bowl, but we would get our urine sample and pull it out. Okay. Um, this is obviously can be painful. Um, now here's a question. Could you imagine the trauma if a male or a female yanks this out? This is a bulb inflated with saline. Have y'all seen that yet? Yeah, someone yanks out the, it's a bloody mess and you just can't even, I can't imagine the pain. So the urethra gets massive trauma to it. Uh, and this can be a big deal. Like they're probably gonna have to see a urologist after this, it's, it's, it's bad. Now with that said, I want you to know, we never recath people in the field. So let me give you an example. Someone yanks out their catheter, we don't put it back in, one. Two, the nurse hands you a new catheter and says, can you recath them? I can't get it to pass. No, you do not, right? You transport them to the hospital. Have I taken people to the hospital and within a minute of us arriving them, the nurse is cathing them and they, they pass it and they're like, take them back? Yeah, we don't take them back. But I'm just letting you know, that happens. So just be aware that uh, we do not recath patients. Okay, it has to be sterile. You're not really trained how to do that right now, okay? Um, and, and, and be aware, we know that we use the catheter as like, it's kind of like a soft tube that's left in somewhere, like an IV catheter. But the one pertaining to uh, the, the urinary system is called a Foley catheter. So just be aware if they throw that word, or you'll occasionally hear it like, oh, I need, you know, gotta empty their Foley, right? They're talking about their, their urinary catheter, their, their Foley catheter, okay? Um, yeah, the big thing is you, it measures urine output. And we should also note, so like say you're doing a LDT or something like that, a long distance transfer, and you, you, you emptying their, their um, catheter bag, you should note the volume and the, like the, the, the quality of the urine, right? Does it have a pungent smell? Is there flux of mucus in it? Is it as dark as sweet tea, right? You know, is there frank blood in it? You know, all those things you've, you've got to figure out um, and, and it should be documented in your chart. It's very important to do that, okay, for continuum of care. Um, all right, moving forward to urinary obstruction and incontinence. So there's obviously, what's the other, so it's kidney stones and renal calculi. What's the other word for a kidney stone, Dalton? Uh, nephrolithiasis. Very good, 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 good. Yep, nephrolithiasis uh, and acute kidney injury, BPH, urethral obstructions. Can these be man-made? Do people stick things in the urethra for pleasure? Yeah, they do. So be aware, people can, Wes is dumbfounded right now, but yeah, they can stick stuff in the urethra, okay, and cause damage. His jaw is literally open, that was good. Uh, urinary tract infections and nerve damage. Who gets nerve damage? People like that have had like obviously trauma to their, their pelvis, but also diabetics. Yeah, we're gonna talk about Fournier's getting green or later. And people, so you know neuropathy happens in our hands and feet with diabetics, right? It also has a propensity to go to the genitalia, okay? So they will lose sensation to their genitalia and they can also lose somatic control of when they're supposed to pee, okay? Or poop, whatever, okay? Uh, so just be generally aware of that. Same thing, you know, someone with nerve damage like a, a paraplegic, they may or may not, depending on the area of the lesion, feel their penis. So they may not know that something's wrong because they can't feel it, okay? Uh, just, just be generally aware. Now. I got a question for you. How come diabetics are so like susceptible to everything? Like if, if there's a horrible well, disease. Well, we're going to talk about this after lunch, but I'll give you the quick and easy area. The quick and easy answer. They have vascular disease. And when your vessels get messed up, it's really hard to recruit blood to go back to the area to heal it. When your vessels get messed up, it's hard to maintain the amount of blood and oxygen needed to maintain your nerves. And when your vessels get messed up, all your cells become terrible. Like they don't work the way they're supposed to. So if I had to sum up one word of diabetic pathology, not the cause, but the pathology it causes, that, that diabetes itself will cause, uh, it's vascular damage, right? So that's where I'm telling you, they have heart attacks, right? I, I, and I'm not picking on diabetics, but they're sick people. Really, up until about 50 years ago, they didn't live, they died, right? Prior to insulin, right, of what we have today, these people just died. And what we're doing is, and, and I'm not, it's not hating on the non-Darwinism of it, but these people are living. So, because they're taking insulin, but they're going to have pathologies, and of course, their life will be shortened because of it, because of their disease. So, you know, this is why diabetic management becomes so important, you know, and not smoking is, is another big one, and of course, managing your blood pressure. But yeah, diabetics have tons of pathology. Like, it's just infinite. But good question. We'll talk about that a lot this afternoon. Now, oddly enough, um, uh, I will really quickly talk about different types of urinary incontinence. What does incontinence mean? Not even yeah, kind of like peeing or pooping on yourself, okay? 
Um, so it's, it's, it's out of somatic control. You don't have control over it. Now, there's something called stress incontinence, and this is when there's physical pressure on it. And so this could be from like pregnancy, prostate surgery, or just straight up obesity. Pushing on your bladder can cause you to pee. So that's stress incontinence. Urgency incontinence, this is someone that like the classic example, someone's putting the key in their door and they're dribbling urine while doing it, right? This happens in older people uh, because they, they have the urge to pee and they're, they're like, I gotta pee, gotta pee, but they can't hold it, okay? So that happens in older people or, you know, you can, well, we won't talk about that. Uh, and then overflow incontinence. This is usually with like diabetes. Again, they've lost nerve control. They don't have the sensation of, oh my God, I need to pee. Okay, it's time to pee. Go ahead and use the muscles to pee. They don't have that, right? Benign prostatic hypertrophy. Same thing with a spinal cord injury, like multiple sclerosis or something to that effect, a broken back, something like that. They could have what's called overflow incontinence. So what happens is they never, they can't really control their bladder, their detrusor muscle to say, you need to pee. So what happens is it fills up and it fills up and it fills up until it literally overflows. It gets so big, there's nowhere else for it to go to where it just kind of starts leaking out. That's overflow incontinence, okay? Now, I don't know if they're gonna test you on those individually, just know there's different types of urinary incontinences, okay? Um, whoops. Yeah, so urinary incontinence is the last of bladder control, okay? We just talked about all this, so I won't, I won't really hit that again. But moving forward to kidney stones, we're gonna, what time is it? How long have we been going on here? What does it say? Do you wanna take a break and then go into kidney stones? 10 minute break and then we'll go into kidney stones, okay? Um,